In early 2015, Anhui University obtained a cache of ancient Chinese manuscripts, which they published in August 2019, just a few months before the pandemic hit the world. Central to the cache is a copy of the Shi, the songs, to which in this talk we shall refer to as Anda Shi, Anda as the University of Anhui, and Shi as the songs. On the surface level, the Anda Shi bear a very close resemblance to the songs recorded in the Mao recension of the Shi Jing, that is, the very recension which defines the foundational text of the classic of the songs, one of the five so-called Confucian classics. The manuscripts continue the sad trend in knowledge acquisition about Chinese or ancient China in that they were not obtained by a scientific excavation. This obviously brings about the standard problems and concerns of working with unprovenanced materials, academically, methodologically, and ethically. Now, our own position is that academically, methodologically, and ethically, the field would lose much more by disregarding the materials than by working with them. Radiocarbon analysis suggests the manuscripts date to circa 330 BC, which was confirmed by chemical analysis of the slips. The slips of the Andashu are numbered consecutively at the tail of the front side of the slips from 1 to 117, of which 24 slips are missing today due to material loss. Altogether, the Andashu carries 57 songs of Mao's 160 songs that are listed in Mao's sections of the so-called heirs of the states. With this, the Anda Shi, the manuscript we are talking about, is the earliest extant iteration of the songs known today. So how do we read the Anda Shi? We don't really know much about the origins of the Mao recension, which, as noted, defines the classic of the songs and which is generally taken as yardstick for evaluating the songs. The Mao recension gained official recognition sometime during the Western Han dynasty, then ousting the three, the, the other three major traditions, which were called Lu, Qi, and Han, but which no longer exist today as integral texts. The origins of the Mao recensions probably go back to the Warring States period, if not earlier. But it is almost certain that the Mao recension is itself based on existing receptions and interpretations of the songs. Now, to what extent the existing versions of the songs and their interpretation differed from one another is impossible to say because so we suggest the differences in the articulation and the reception of the songs only materialize substantially once the songs are written out. But what does that mean? As the result of our close reading of the Anda Shi, and Adam and I currently have a volume in print that analyzes the first 25 songs of this con connection, the songs of the so-called Royal Zhou and the Royal Shao, which created a conceptual unity at the time, we developed a theory which suggests an oral, but please do not confuse this with oral, an oral primacy of the songs. But this oral primacy did not extend to semantic fixity. The Anda Shi, and the songs of the Mao recension adhere to a common sound mold. Yet while the individual sound molds are stable, different text communities could fill the sound molds of orally fixed songs creatively for their purposes with precise semantic content by way of what we call 
a writing supported text performance. We are explicitly not taking a stance about the oral nature of the songs one way or another. We actually believe the discussion is futile because the nature of the songs, be they oral or written, cannot be proven either way. The truth probably lies on a scale somewhere in the middle between the two extremes. Our position is that during the Warring States period, the songs had long been orally fixed and they were defined by specific phonetic textures and sound molds. But this stability did not extend to semantic precision beyond a particular version of the songs. Now, this is of course not to say that the written word was superfluous or at best secondary in the articulation of sound-based songs. Quite the opposite, actually. It was through a writing supported text performance that a particular reading of the songs was fixed by affording to it an interpretation that would have suited the community in question and served their understanding of and engagement with the songs. In other words, as the songs were voiced in writing, the written word would lend semantic precision to orally fixed songs, thus enabling different subgroups with a profound specialization in the tradition to lay claim on the songs. This semantic precision probably differed between the communities and their reading of the songs. It certainly showed substantial differences between the Mao recension and the Anda Shi, that is the manuscript we're working off here. But please note, we are here not talking about the odd choice of a different graph in a song, which is often explained as a purely phonetic variant because people take an isolated snippet and, and see differences and explain that the songs are entirely unstable. Rather, as our reference to the song White Boat makes it clear that is the topic of our talk today, such substantiations of the songs followed an internally coherent understanding of the songs as held by the communities in question and carried out in a sound and systematic fashion. The disparities between the Andar Shi and the Maori Sension of the Classic of Songs follow an internally consistent logic. They are a show of deliberate choices executed with great care and in a systematic way. It follows, we must take the Andar Shi as an independent iteration of the songs, and we must refrain from forcing it through the Maori Sension, and thus we must refrain from reading it through the classic, the received classic of the songs. The goal of taking the Anda Shi, our manuscript, on its own terms, is we seek to establish a hypothetical amic perspective of reading the songs. And this means we cast light on how those who wrote out the Anda Shi afforded meaning to the songs. As Bertin reminds us, behind the iteration and interaction of texts is always a contact of personality, personalities and not of things. Texts are the secondary products of the multifaceted social realities of meaning construction. The primary actors are people, individual or groups, participating in a discourse. As there are always groups and individuals behind the iteration of a text, it is our responsibility to take their use of it seriously. As long, of course, it reflects structural and systematic choices. And so we must not force a previously unknown iteration through the dominant sub-tradition, which would be Mao in our case, just because we may be cautious of going against prevailing terms 
that have come to accept a particular sub-tradition, Mao, as normative. In attempting an emic reading of the songs, we thus set out to approach the text on its own terms and on this basis, reconstruct what its textual community may have made of it. Now, before Adam takes over and gives us a detailed reading of the song in question, we need, of course, clarify the notion of a sound mold and what we mean by it. Sound molds carry a song's words, and thus they define the individual song of the shu of the songs phonetically. But as our term mold suggests, during the warring states period, they also served as containers that can be filled quite literally with prescriptive, obviously within prescriptive limits, with semantically malleable content. Differences between the anda shu, that is our manuscript, and the mao shu, that is the received classic of the songs, show that the vari variances between the versions are not selective, let alone random. Rather, something quite systematic is an operation when during the warring states period, that is the second half of the first millennium BC, communities with specialization in the tradition are voicing the shu through the written word. Their choices as to how to articulate a single word or compound fundamentally dictates the overall conceptualization of the song in question, as Adam will show. The systematic approach to articulating the songs through the written word can be shown effectively for this song, which we call Yong One, as it appears as the first song uh, under the section of the state of Yong, uh, which was in uh, Northeast Honan province uh, uh, in the manuscript. Now, Yong One in the Andam manuscript corresponds with exactly the same song in, in exactly the same position in the Mao recension, which is Mao 45 in a running count. We see meaningful variants that stretch consistently over entire lines such that they alter dramatically the overall makeup of the song while keeping intact the phonetic value of its sound molds. Now, Yong Wan just happens to be one of two instances in the Andam manuscript text where a discrete name is provided for a song, albeit it's listed after the last song at the end of the subsection. Nonetheless, the manuscript text of the songs itself validates the title as Bai Zhou, which literally reads White Boat. In Mao, and as far as we know, in the text of the other major Western Han traditions, the corresponding song was called Bai Zhou, Cedar Boat. Now, it seems a simple enough philological exercise to render the graphs Bai and Bai equal as though they wrote the same word, whether it be white or cedar. The graph Bai is, of course, just adding a tree signifier to the phonophore Bai, white. Both graphs occur in scripts starting from Shang Oracle Bones through Warring States Chu script, uh, which is modern day Hubei province. So we cannot make the argument that by cedar might have been unavailable for use at the time the Andam manuscript text was written out. We shall not insist on white boat, anticipating any possible question or something like that, as per the Andam text. But as part of our reading strategy, we suggest that white as a symbol of death might be a more compelling reading given how the boat as an image operates also as a vessel, perhaps carrying the subject in addition to corresponding with the phrase until death in line five of each stanza, which you will see in a second, um, as well as the consistent use of just the word by without the tree signifier in the manuscript text. The two words, white and cedar, both work seamlessly as images in crafting meetings systematically in their respective versions of the song. Now, as far as the song's reception, particularly in the Mal tradition, as it's expressed through the Mal preface, which was probably written towards the end of the Eastern Han, uh, at the very end, let's say, of the second century AD, uh, Professor Meyer, my humble self, shall propose that by, by, that is the sound of the words white or cedar actually evokes yet another homophone as a pun that is crucial to understanding how the Mal tradition explained the song as part of a larger matrix in contextualizing the songs historically. But we shall leave this as a surprise in anticipation of our upcoming CTMC journal article. Next slide, please. At the upper left, you will find the lyrics of the Anda song. 
at the upper right, you will find the lyrics of the corresponding song in the Mao songs. Now, don't be in a rush. I'm, we're going to leave this up for, for, for a couple minutes. Um, below the Chinese, uh, we provide our translation first, and just below that, uh, James Legg's translation. Now, we've gone ahead and we've marked up the text a little bit to suit our purposes. Um, and as we get through the explanation, we will we'll highlight some of the, the, uh, the points that we would like the participants uh, to call their attention to. Now, Yong One is composed in two stanzas defined by highly repetitive elements, each stanza in seven lines, each line in four words. But when line three of each stanza of the Anda Shi writes, Jan Bi Liang Mu, submerging are those two wild ducks. The corresponding line in Mao is Dan Bi Liang Mao, falling down are those two tufts of hair said of a young man. This shows a drastic difference in the selection of the written word which simultaneously adhering to an integral sentence comprised of four stable sound molds. That is the sounds of the words writing this line is exactly the same across the two version. As mentioned, the song lyrics in the Andau version afford a prime example of how communities with expertise in the tradition filled sound molds with precise semantic contents as they saw fit. But precisely how? We strongly encourage readers of the Anda songs to pay attention to how semantic content is shown through the graphic representation of the words. And this might deviate from uh, conventional reading practices of people working with Warring States manuscripts, where they think that the written graph is somewhat meaningless and that the kind of, in, in this particular instantiation of the songs, songs were just kind of penned, penned out mindlessly. Uh, we think that is exactly the opposite. Now take, for example, the instance of the water signifier in the Anda instantiation. Words written with a water signifier occur at, at word one in line one, word four of line two, and word three of line three. Reading the songs shows a consistent and integral logic aided by precise semantic content. Intersecting three words written with water signifiers forms a distinctive imagery that is part of a larger image texture. Now, Dirk uh, and myself will usually refer to this, and we will in, uh, refer to it throughout our book in print as an image program. The bird signifier in the composition of the word wild duck at word four of line three is specific and intentional, and intentional to be sure. It is part of the water metaphor. In the Mao recension, however, the words falling and two tufts of hair are written with hair signifiers, which also in themselves show a consistent and integral logic aided by precise semantic content to create its own distinctive imagery that is part of a larger image texture for the community that created it. And so our approach begs the question, why disrupt the consistency of the images that is words in their signifying graphs in the Anda version, just in order to make the lyrics fit the lyrics of the Mal recension. And that's just kind of a basic working principle. The written interpretation of this line is the necessary element of having afforded systematically different meaning to, orally fit, to an orally fixed song. Trying to equate the two sentences and thus the two versions of the song because of their sh shared phonetic value is to us unwarranted. Doing so negates the ingenuity of the sure traditions that produce them. It would not just mean we fail to understand how meaning was afforded to the songs by different communities during the Warring States period. It would moreover mean that as the next step, we fail to use the opportunity to understand in return the principles that show how and why the classic of songs were written out. Now, as we will show, line three is the key. It determines how the communities in question each conceptualize their song. The way other key terms of the song are dealt with, in particular in anda e, um, in mao e, and anda de, mao te, is dependent on this. As we understand it, line three in the mao tradition required the sound molds carrying the words e, which in the anda text means meaning, right in conduct, and de in the anda text meaning virtue, morality, or inner strength, to be given precise semantic meanings of their own that agreed with the appearance of the young man. That is, the appearance of the young man in, in uh, the version 
of uh, that that mall was either created or was working with required uh, that community to make uh, kind of a systematic change once the young man appears in line three. That is, the ducks are gone and the young man appears. As such, the sound mold, ek, filled dek, or duh, as I just said, meaning inner strength in anda, was filled tek, or t, singular one in mal. No problem at all there. And the sound mold i was filled with two words identical in sound, ngai, that share a common phonophore in the written script. This makes it a little bit more, it gives it a little different nuance to it. The graph in the mal recension, e, which needed to respond in meaning with t, that is the singular, my singular one, my pair, um, uh, in the following sentence, required an explanation by Mal and by commentators in the Mal tradition thereafter, as it was being given the rare, if not fabricated, meaning of pair or mate. This is, in our opinion, where the Mal version of the song reveals itself to be an alternative version. The words e and de, that is meaning proper meaning and virtue or inner strength, on the other hand, are a widely used preclass are, are widely used preclassical terms. Their coupling is part of the very fabric of justification in early Chinese literature. We thus cannot help but associate the pair of terms with the pair of wild ducks and thus the pair of lovers. In the Anda text, the promise mentioned in the song, until death I swear, is afforded a force entirely absent in the Mao tradition. As Adam has shown convincingly, I believe, at least um, I like to think so, is the song White Boat of the Anda manuscripts and its counterpart in the Mao recension, the Cedar Boat of the classic of songs, are entirely stable phonetically. The sound molds into which the different graphs are placed are intact, and the phonetic texture of the song as a whole remains entirely consistent. But as our analysis has shown, the way these sound molds were filled by different communities with their different needs reflects an entirely different grasp of the song, one which in both cases, however, Mao and Andashi follows wholly systematic considerations guiding internally sound coherent choices. Line three, we noted, determines how the communities in question each conceptualize their song. In particular, the pair E versus E in, in Mao and D in Anda versus T in Mao, as Adam has explained, is dependent on this. With the different items of the pairs being fully consistent phonetically. It shows beyond any doubt, we think, that the appropriation of a song by a community in question followed an internally consistent logic. Variation between versions is not random at all and based on an instability of how a graph is composed. Rather, it reflects systematic choices and the instability of the writing is of the writing system is precisely what leads to the stability of the interpretation of a song that comes without external commentaries, in the sense that the writing features or functions as an embedded commentary itself. Phonosemantic significance can be added to a certain graph just to introduce a further layer of signification to a song as the community behind the articulation of that song saw fit, as they were affording meaning to the song in question. And they did it systematically, both in Mao and in the previously unknown iteration of Andashi. To deny this and instead force this new iteration of the songs through the received Mao recension, just because it is the classic, would mean to undo the great value of this particular manuscript. The Andashi, the new manuscript, enables us for the first time as a thought experiment for sure, to carry out an emic reading of how a community worked to afford meaning to the songs. But 
our story does not end with this manuscript. It does not end with the Andashu. Based on our findings, some of which we presented here to you, it is now possible to go back and take a fresh look at the Mao recension, realizing similar practices and principles behind this particular appropriation of the songs by the community that would later come to define the classic of the songs. As you can see, our project of seeking to understand what is going on with the songs has only just begun. Thank you.